because really the sermon this morning is going to be about father and son. It's going to be a father and a son. Um, this relationship, when we think about fathers, I mean, we know that it is one of the most important relationships that we could have. Interestingly enough, usually when it's Father's Day, right, we really just kind of, it's not like Mother's Day. You guys notice that? The Mother's Day, it's kind of the day, I mean, you don't, you don't plan anything on that day. It's very different. Father's Day is kind of like, ah, it's dad. I mean, give him a, a McDonald's uh, sandwich. You know, he's, he'll, he'll be happy with that. Right? I mean, we did that at our church once, right? We, uh, we had all the dads, uh, um, what is it, M- McMuffins. Uh, we're like, that's as creative as men get when you talk about celebrating dads. Um, but, but, but just let me ask you a question. How many here live with your dads? How many here live with your dads? All right, one, couple of you guys, couple, all right. How many of you uh, take care of your dads? I mean, you live because you have to take care of them, okay? Maybe not all of you. What about, uh, your, is your father alive? Who has living fathers today? Right, many of us do. Many of us know the importance of this relationship. I don't have to, like, show you all the stats of how important it is to have a father, how it affects your, your psychology, your, your, your mental um, growth, your educational um, development, right? Well, I don't have to show you that for you to know how critical it is. Every study that you read, uh, when it comes to the human dynamic of who we are and how we grow as people, at some point deal, deals with our fathers. What's interesting is that when you think about stories about our fathers, is that many of you can recount um, you know, that, that ball that your father threw and that catch that you made and the games that you played, and the rough play that you loved. So maybe you have good memories of your father. Many, many of you probably do. But perhaps other of you, maybe you lost your father. Maybe you have no relationship with your father. Like many of us, especially in this broken culture, right, to speak of a good relationship with your father is almost unheard of to a certain extent, right? Especially when, what, 56% of all marriages end in divorce, right? So when we talk about fathers, I mean, there's not a lot there for us to, to glean from and to pull from. And so um, the question is, what, what, what does that do in our hearts, right? Wounds, of course, there's wounds, there, there's scars. There's learned behaviors that just kind of come out and you don't know where it came from. But the bigger question is, where do we get this concept from of fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, the importance of a father? Is it a cultural concept that we came up with, the Neanderthals came up with, and go, oh, I'm going to be your dad, and let's just love each other. That, that's, that's not really the way it works. This concept of father and son, father and daughters, is rooted, watch this, not just in the Bible, but it's rooted before the world was created. This relationship between father and son, this union that we so long for and maybe we've lost and maybe we've struggled to keep up with, it's not a reality that we simply thought of in the Bible. It's something that God, uh, God the Father and Jesus the Son were a part of. And when we look at this sermon this morning in, the, in John chapter 5, verse 19 to 30, remember, Jesus is making the case that he's not just a prophet, He's not just Messiah, but he is the son of God. He is equal with God. He is the same with God. Here's how he makes his argument. You ready for this? He doesn't appeal to some theology of the Old Testament. He doesn't appeal to say, look at my great works. Look how supernatural I am. Do you know how he appeals to his equality with God? He calls himself son, and he calls God his father. In fact, Jesus, these are 11 um, 11 verses, right? Just 11 verses. In these 11 verses, he says, he calls himself son 10 times. Almost in every verse, he says, son, 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 son. And he calls the father, father seven times. In fact, Jesus calls God the father more than, uh, Jesus, uh, the title father is the one Jesus, uh, Jesus uses 165 times. More than any other title in the New Testament. If you were to ask Jesus, what's your favorite name for, for God? You know what he would tell you? Father. Now here's, here's where the rubber meets the road, right? For the Jews, the Jews also prayed Father. So it's not a new concept. The Jews believed that God was their Father. But here's where things change. The Jews believed that God was the Father of the nation of Israel. A corporate identity of fatherhood. Here's what Jesus is doing, right? He's saying, yeah, he's Father of Israel, but you know who he's also Father with? He's, a father. he's my Father. Israel was a picture of the heart of God, but Jesus was the true recipient of the Father's love. Jeremiah 3.19 gives us a picture of this. It says, How gladly 
Would I treat you like my children and give you a pleasant land? Talking to Israel here. The most beautiful inheritance of any nation. I thought you would call me father and not turn away from following me. They, they prayed our father. But you know what they also did? They added this word in heaven. Or they added some word that would separate them in terms of familiarity. In terms that would make them feel like actual sons. Jesus, but here's, here's what Jesus was doing. He was not using this term to relate to Israel as a whole. He was saying that he was God's unique son. He was, in some way, God's only unique favorite son. Because of that, he is the same with God. Here's the problem, again, that the Jews rejected this notion. To say that Jesus was son and God was father was to say, how many gods are there? Two, right? Now there's two gods. Well, according to monotheism, right, and the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4, there was a prayer that would always pray, right? And maybe you've heard this prayer even at synagogues. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Here's what Jesus is saying. He, he, this is what they're hearing. They're hearing, no, no, you're saying that you're the Son, so you're one God, and God the Father, He's another God. In fact, if you think of Isaiah 42.8, God says that He will not yield or share His glory with another one. In some way, they believe that Jesus is claiming that, that there are two gods and he's sharing in this glory. But, but here is where this morning is going to take us, that Jesus is not claiming that there's two gods, right? Christianity does not believe that there are two gods, but we, what do we believe? We believe in one, essence, one God, one essence, in three persons. Uh, the powerful identity of the Trinity. What Jesus is claiming is this. He's clarifying, he's expanding, and he's open up, opening up the floodgates of who God is. Think about that for a second. It's as if the veil was closed, completely black, and they understood God in one way, and then here comes Jesus and says, you don't have the full picture. I'm bringing now the full picture of who the Father is. So here's what he's saying. God is revealed in the Father, as the Jew would have, would have understood, but God is also revealed equally in the Son. He is actually God in the flesh. He's not a separate God, but he's God in the flesh displaying the nature of God to the world. C.S. Lewis put it this way. We must think of the Son always, so to speak, streaming forth from the Father. Like a, a light from a lamp or heat from a fire or thoughts from a mind, He is a self-expression of the Father, what the Father has to say. Here's the point. Jesus grounds His equality, watch this, everything He's saying on His sonship relationship with God the Father. The relationship is the center of, uh, of everything he does. The reason why he's healing on the Sabbath is not simply because he wants to do something amazing and cool people could be in awe of. What he's doing is he's trying to show them, I am not like anybody else. I am the Son of God. He does it from this place of relationship. And as we look at these passages, we're going to go into it right now, you're going to see uh, this thread of how the Father and Son, the Father and Son, the Father and Son, and the power and gifts that He gives the Son. And so let me, let's go ahead and go to uh, John chapter 5, verse 19, and let's read the first two verses here. And, and, and just pay attention to this language. Pay attention to the language here that Jesus uses. So Jesus is defending himself against accusations, and, and they want to murder Jesus, or they want to persecute him because of these things that he is saying, that God is his Father. Here's verse 19. Jesus gave him this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father, look at this language, loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. Jesus begins his defense by saying, I do not work separately. I am not a second God. I am not a lesser God. I am one with the Father. I don't move apart from my Father. But he uses a key word here, this affectionate word in the Greek, phileo. Okay, this is in verse 20. The Father phileos the Son. They say love that is based on affection, on feeling, on fondness, on liking. It is the love when you are with your spouse and say, man, I'm, I just, the way she takes care of me, man, that's just, that's special, right? The, the way my kids do what they do, I love them. Like that tender love is a love of affection, deep and tender feeling of love, this same word is used in Matthew 10, 37, when Jesus challenges those disciples to leave all and love him alone. 
He says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Is Matthew 10, 37. Here's this word phileo, this Greek word that really is bringing the deepest love that you can imagine, right? I would find it very troubling if I told fathers and mothers and sons and daughters, do you love your mom? And you go, no, I don't love my mom. That would be a problem, right? Same thing with fathers and mothers. We told you, you know, how much do you love your kids? You go, I, I love them and I love everything they do. That, that's a deeper love than the agape love. You know what that, that love is, right? I love Netflix. I love my new tester oven. I love my new Apple iWatch, right? That's a way different type of love. This love is a lot different. In fact, this, this word is only used 21 times, and in Matthew 26, is used to describe a kiss. How tender is that word? Isn't that beautiful? And so Jesus starts with this foundation. He is moved by love, by the Father's love, and this relationship between God and Jesus. Here's what it does. It removes all abstract notion of God. It's not just God, but He is first and foremost Father. This is incredibly personal. As a father bestows all things to his sons, right? I mean, fathers today, right? You save, you you, you create an inheritance, you want to leave a legacy with your children, you want them to learn, be good citizens. As you do all these things, so the father does these things, but he does them on the basis of of love towards the son. And here's what we're going to see, is that Jesus has no less knowledge than uh, the Father, no less wisdom, no less power, no, uh, no less work, a miraculous work than the Father. Here's why. Not just because He's Jesus, but because He is loved. Because He is loved, everything is based on this phileo love. And so as we begin, and I ask you questions about your father and where the, the notion of father and son and daughter relationship comes from, I want to I read to you John 17. This is Jesus' prayer right before the passion, before He's going to be uh, crucified. And this is what He prays for His disciples. Father, I want those you, you have given me to be with me where I am, to see my glory, the glory you have given me. Watch this word. Because you loved me before the creation of the world. Now, for you, I don't know where you are with this concept, but just stop for a moment. Before Genesis 1, if you were to ask, what was the, mo- the, 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 the emotions of God? What was God doing? What does Je- uh, John 17 say? He was loving Jesus. Think about that. Father, Son, Holy Spirit were dwelling in some incredible union of love, and it is from this place that God brings forth the world. This is why you matter. This is why the world and the earth actually matters, because God made it with love. Not only that, Not only was God doing this before creation, and we see this storyline through the Old Testament, but even when Jesus took on flesh and came to the world, God affirmed him. Uh, Matthew 3, 17, Jesus is being baptized, and the Father says from heaven, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And you you, you gotta hear me here. This is for you. And I want you to, to capture this. Jesus received his identity and did not achieve his identity. I'm going to say that again. Jesus did not, uh, uh, Jesus received his identity and didn't achieve his identity. You see, up to this point, did Jesus perform any miracles? Up to this point, did Jesus uh, raise the dead? Up to this point, did he have some incredible discourse that he gave? What does the Father say? I love you. See, he did not cast out any demons, perform miracles, yet God loved him with this phileo love. Before he even did any supernatural work, his identity was that of of a son. And I want you to hear this because for many of us, one of the reasons we can't get over ourselves and we can't grow is because we can't simply sit and receive the love that God has bestowed on us without us putting in the work. You hear what I'm saying? Right? Many of us, we want to work for God's love. But we need only to receive his love and not to achieve his love. I know that's difficult for us naturally. We have a natural bent to approval and and seek approval and seek love out of works. But we see Jesus never did that. Everything he did was from a place of love. And it comes from this father relationship that he has, uh, this relationship with his father that he had. So so here's the point. Jesus acts uh, like the father equal with God because he is one with the Father. He is loved with the Father. On a, on a lower level, think about us, right? As, as, and that's a really like low analogy, right? I mean, we're creaturely people. It's not perfect. 
right? But, the, I mean, think about fathers and sons, right? Um, I mean, I never lived close with my father, but I have, according to my wife and my mom, and they go, you're like your father. And I'm going, but I was never with my father like that. So how is it that I'm like my father, right? I mean, even the natural processes of our bodies and minds and DNA, you know, make us like our fathers. On a lower level, this is an example, but Jesus is saying this, I am not just a little bit like my father. I am God in the flesh because I am one with the father. Jesus defends his claim for breaking the Sabbath, defends his claim for healing works of mercy, as we looked at last week, not based on anything other than this relationship with God that he has. Jesus is like God because that is who God is. And so, like any good father, God the Father bestows on Jesus two things. He bestows on Jesus the power to give life to the dead, one, and he gives the power to judge the living and the dead. And so look here at verse 22. This is what we're reading verse 22. Uh, this is John chapter 5, verse 22. For not even the Father judges anyone. He has given all judgment to the... Oh, sorry. Sorry, guys. What am I missing here? Okay. Sorry about that. I got my notes mixed up here. There we go. All right. Um, it's verse 21. I'm sorry. Look at verse 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. All right, so again, the, uh, the Father bestows gifts on the Son because of this loving relationship. He gives them the, the power to give life and the power um, to judge the living and the dead. And, and, and I think when we think about life, think about how elusive that quest is of life, right? Most uh, of us, if we were offered a, an extra 50 years of life, we would take it in an instant, right? I read um, a couple of studies here from the Colorado State University and Boston School of Medicine that gives you uh, some ideas of how to uh, have a longer life or a longer way of living, right? One says, live near plants. And it says this, when you are exposed to greenery, greenness around your home, your probability to die is less compared to those with less greenness around the house. Or, or, or the other one, be an optimist, right? Think happy thoughts. Write journal. I don't know if you heard this new thing that people color, uh, adult coloring books. You ever heard of that? I don't know, maybe that's maybe I, I read that, but I was like, people are coloring. I, I don't know. I thought that was in, in high school, but I mean, in, the, in in kindergarten. But it's fine. There's so many different ways for us to try to extend our life or to live longer, so that we can experience this world in a greater way, because life is an elusive quest for all of us. Even this year, for many people, I'm sure, the passing of I mean, all of us. I mean, I don't know, but most of us have been touched by somebody in our family or somebody in a, in a second layer of our family that passed. And we feel powerless, right? Because life, we have no power to extend our life. Well, the, well here we read that, that the Father pours out on the Son this power to give life. And here's how Jesus gives us life. First, when Adam and Eve turned away from God and believed the serpent's word, they fell into sin. But not just fell into sin and like made a mistake. They actually died. They, they were dead. And this was not a non-existence, but it was that their heart will be dark, will be dead against the Lord's commands. They no longer looked at God as Father. They looked at Him as, 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 as just an, an external God who put rules and regulations upon them. And I think we can relate, right? Na we naturally love other things. We naturally seek other things other than God. And, and, and so here comes Jesus and liberating us from this prison of death. And this is how He gives us life. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... The new life or creation has come. The old, has, the old life has gone. The new is here. This is what Jesus offers when, he, when, when the Father bestows life on him. And it's not just a spiritual life that we have from the dead, but there is also an anchoring promise for those who believe Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Uh, if you go down to verse 28 on John chapter 5, look at verse 28 and verse 29, speaks of, when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Eternal life is also a physical reality and an anchoring hope for those who love and trust Jesus. In fact, if we only believe that the cross saves us from our sins and not renews our body into an everlasting world where we get to be Jesus, then we're, 
we're not fu uh, fully capturing the gospel. We're missing something. The reason why oftentimes the gospel is not enough is because we're not anchored in the, in the, in the comprehensive truth of this promise. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, Paul says this, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all people most to be pitied. That means sorrowful. That means burst out and cry, and cry. Like if we only had our promise in this spiritual sense that we're freed from sin here today, though that, that's powerful and true, the finality of that is that in, in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be a true life with Christ that we will sense, feel, taste, and know. So what does this tell us uh, uh, this morning? That no preacher has the power to give you life. No person has the power to give you the life that you seek. No job has the power to extend that which satisfies you. Jesus does not accomplish this by himself, but he does it with unity with the Father. That elusive quest of life, that elusive quest of eternal renewal is not something that you can muster up or something that can, you can just buy. It's not something that you're going to get from an incredible worship team and it's going to give you the tingly feeling or some incredible expositor. Life is only given to you in Christ. And so when we come to the Word, we come to our lives, we seek Christ in Christ alone. We have that song that, that we sang that it says, um, Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. You ever heard that song we sang a couple of weeks ago? And it says, Hallelujah, uh, Jesus is my life. You know, what does is, what is life look like when you live uh, when, uh, when you lived in a way that your entire life depends on Christ? Well, this is what the Father gives the Son out of this place of love. What else does, does He give the Son? Okay, now look at verse 22 uh, now with me. For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son. Okay, so first, what does He give Him? The power to give life to the dead. Then He gives Him the power to judge, to judge all things, all judgment. Now, um, I think we have one judge in our church, <laughs> but um, all, all I got to say is uh, I don't want to stand before any judge, right? Um, yes, I've been that guy a long, long while ago that I used to get in trouble with not paying car tickets and uh, parking tickets, and you have to show up in the court, and I hate that. But, but I mean, who, who here wants to stand before a judge and being discerned and being told, you're lying, you're, truth, you're saying the truth, you did this wrong. Here's evidence against you. I mean, I can't handle that in, with my own house. I can't even handle it. I can't imagine what that would be like. But here's what's incredible, what the Father gives the Son. He says, Jesus is equal to me in the sense that he will have that power to judge not just us, but all things. When you think about this word uh, judgment and judgment of all things, I think that um, you know, it's kind of a scary word, but if you think about what was happening here in the first century, religious teachers were great at judging themselves. They were judging themselves according to what they did. We kept the Sabbath. Look at me. They gave to the poor. They were very generous. Oh, look what I did. I went to church. They begin to judge. We go to synagogue every, every Sabbath. They kept everything God had commanded. There is the standard upon which they kept going at and said, I, I, I'm good, I'm good, I, I kept everything, and here's what the Father does. He says, Jesus is your judge. God has granted the power of judgment to the Son, and here's what it does. It foreshadows Christ's eventual judgment of all mankind, Revelation chapter 20. And when you think about, I don't know about you, man, but I, I hear this word judgment, I mean, people, I mean, he would, people, what do people even say, right? Like, nobody can judge me. Isn't people say that in that word that people say or, or a statement? Today, more than ever, saints, I, I don't think that you can speak truth unless there is some backlash to that. Anybody face that? I don't know if you heard this, this concept called cancel culture. You ever heard of that concept? That, right, that if you communicate certain truths that are clearly like in, in nature, <laughs> clearly right in, uh, in your psyche, in your even commentary, that you will automatically face a backlash against your truth. I think we don't like right or wrong. We don't like judgment, not just because we're going to be found guilty, but because right or wrong is sort of um, subjective. We believe it's, and this is a term for this, the it, uh, truth is subjective, that there is no standard of truth. The truth is whatever you think it means. Truth is whatever society tells you it is. Truth is whatever uh, your culture tells you. 
And so here, here comes the scriptures, here comes Jesus and says, no, this is the truth. This is the truth. And then you begin to be, as they say now, canceled or kicked out or facing a backlash against truth. We're living in days, brothers and sisters, where we must speak the truth of God because Jesus is our judge and not man. Amen? We speak the truth in love. And so here's what Jesus is going to judge. He's going to judge uh, the nations, Romans 2, 6. He's going to judge private and individual sins, Matthew 11, verse 20. And he's going to judge the motives of our hearts. He's going to judge the motives of all hearts. And here's, look at verse 23, and here's why judgment happens. Here, his beautiful passage, verse 23, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Father, who, uh, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. In other words, if you reject Jesus' judgment, you're rejecting the Father. But what's beautiful here is that Jesus' judgment upon the world is not um, anger, you know, an anger judgment. It's not an, a judgment that you may think is uh, in spite uh, or anger. Acts 17 says that he will judge the world in righteousness. His standard will be his relationship with God, what love is, what truth is, what the Scripture teaches. And so here... Uh, what we hear this morning is this, that, that the Father loves the Son and he, he bestows on Him this power to give life to the dead, this power to judge the living and the dead. And, and here's, here's where we're, we're going um, and we're landing here together, is that that promise of this relationship and all the benefits of this relationship is what you're shared and called into entering. Look at, um, go to verse 24. Look at verse 24. Look what uh, Jesus says. Uh, really offering grace to these Jewish hearers. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, watch what he has, has eternal life, which the Father has given power, right? And will not be judged, which is the other thing that God has given them power to have, but is crossed over from death into life. Tim Keller says, unless we point people to the good news of God's grace, people will not be able to bear the weight of God's judgment. You guys hear that? If Jesus would have stopped this, this, this discourse right here, there is really no hope for the Jews. If Jesus would have just said, I have the power to give you life and to put you to death and to raise you up and to judge you, I mean, that sounds, I don't know if I want that God, right? I mean, that's very, that's a lot to, to, to take in. But Jesus offers this to them and offers this to us. That it is Christ who, who gives true eternal life and will not be judged, but you will cross over. You will go through a great gulf and come into a new place. But here's how it happens. Hear my word. And if you want to underline a word in your Bible, if you want to like print something and, and just let it speak to you, um, like all the days of your life, just put that word, hear my word. Hearing is not just listening. Jesus throughout his ministry was recorded multiple times saying, he that has ear, he has, has an ear, let him hear, which means consider to, attend to, pause, digest what is being said. In fact, he even says very truly, which means consider, like this is what I'm about to tell you, this is truth. See, we come and hear the word of God and, and hear the Lord, not like a class or like a lecture or not like a general, like somebody's general advice or somebody's ideas of who Christ is. When we hear, when we come to Christ, we hear the person of Christ through His Holy Spirit. And here, can I tell you how you hear the whole? You know, when you say, "How do you, how do you hear God?" I don't mean Jesus. I could hear His Word. What Sunday morning? Well, yes, you hear God's Word here this morning. But let me tell you the ways you hear God in your experiences. As you go through this week and you begin to face trials and you begin to hear the Holy Spirit, some, you know, the, the person of God speaking to you and telling you truth from a lie. As you begin to have a community of people texting you and praying for you and telling you, brother and sister, this is what God is telling you to do. This is what God, I feel God is, has for you. As you pray during the week, as you are driving in your car and you're just asking, Lord, what is my purpose in life? God, Jesus will speak. This is the word of Christ. As you have visions and dreams, as the word gives you a prophetic word in your heart and you begin to see, is that, is that God speaking? Like, what is going on? What is God saying? We must hear the word of Christ, not the word of a preacher or a charismatic show. We must hear the word of Christ. But here's, the, here's what I think the problem is, and, and this is, I faced this when I started seminary about, uh, when I 
first uh, was in seminary, and my family got all behind it. It was about five years ago. And at the same time, I was a full-time pastor, full-time eight hours a day seminary, full-time dad, and like 30-hour job. Okay, now that, I, I used to wear like a badge of honor. Right? You know, like, look at me, look how much I'm doing, look at my multi, I could do all things well. Any multitaskers in the house? Maybe, okay, maybe, maybe it's just me. But the, in my mind, I thought, I could do all these things and, and still hear the content and get things right. But what I learned very quickly from the first week was that multitasking while studying it reduced my ability to like, keep information, right? I mean, any, any students in the house, right? Maybe you, you know what I'm talking about. Even if you want to learn, you can't be doing five things at the same time. But the reason, uh, as I was just praying through this, I, I began to think that many of us multitask spiritually, that we, we have all these type of different voices, right? From, from our jobs, for our kids, for our life, everything takes over our time, and we don't hear Christ, we often hear the word of Christ he, telling us many things to us, and we simply go, yeah, yeah, but I have all these other things that I have to tend to with my mental space and spiritual space. But if you hear God's word, here's what he's saying to us. He's saying that when we come to Christ, that we're dead in our hearts, that we need actual purpose, that we need to be regenerated, we need life in us. His word, if you hear it right, tells you that there are promises and not judgment for those who believe in Christ. If you hear his word, you will hear him affirm you and tell you, I love you. I love you. Redeeming you, of, uh, uh, forgiving you, and satisfying your heart. But we're too busy. We're too busy spiritually, mentally, that when God, Christ speaks, it's just another word in our circles of influence. You guys hear what I'm saying? You guys with me on this so far? So, so the question is for us this morning is, are we listening to God's voice? Are we truly pausing and saying, hear Christ's word. What's he doing in my life right now? In my experience, in my family, in my prayer, in my community? What is he bringing out uh, to bear in, in, um, in light of all this? And here's what he does. When you hear the voice of Christ, two things happen. And this is verse 25 and 28, 29. Look at verse 25, truly I say to you, the time is coming, even now has arrived, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son, and those who hear will live. His voice will wake up the, the spiritually dead. But verse 28, do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in the tombs or graves will hear His voice. We read that earlier. And will come out, and those who did good deeds to resurrection life, and those who committed bad deeds to a resurrection of judgment. He, with his voice, he will raise up physically dead. He will raise all people up for this purpose. So what is, uh, as I land here, what is uh, the, our goal here this morning is that we have a Savior uh, who is God and who speaks. He's not silent, but he speaks to us as son, in whom all promises dwell, in whom all judgment exists, and in whom all life is found. Jesus said this in John 10, my sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. How astonishing is this, right? That Jesus is not hiding from you. He's not playing peekaboo, right? He's not, you're not kind of like, oh, I can't find God. Where is he? I'm doing all I got. I don't know why I can't hear God. God is not silent. The problem is that we need to stop multitasking. <laughs> Jesus offers his hearers. This is what I think he's doing to the Jews here. Jews understood this concept of God the Father, but what he's doing, I believe, he's elevating the frequency to hear God's plan. God is in the Son. This was God's plan from the very beginning. And let's finish here, verse 30. By myself, he is here, here he began, he ends how he started. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Okay, I can do, I mean, can you think about what Jesus is saying here? Just pause that again. Think about that. I can do nothing. Here's God, Jesus, in the flesh, saying, I cannot do anything without my Father. If Jesus depended on the Father for everything, brother and sister, should we not depend on our Father for everything? And I don't mean all, uh, you know, physical, material things. I mean true life. Renewal of our souls, renewal of our mind, renewal of our, of our hearts. But we're so distracted. Here's what Jesus says. I did not come here to please myself, but to please him. And I think that's where we get it mixed up, right? 
We get it mixed up because we, we, we want to try to do things for our own good. We're distracted by ourselves and our desires. We do what is counter to the Spirit because it is pleasing to us. So the religious leaders, here's what they were doing. They were trying to save themselves, please themselves, judge themselves, satisfy themselves. But what they got wrong is that Jesus came to do the exact opposite of that. When Jesus came, he did not come to judge. You know what he came to do? He came to receive judgment, right? He came to receive the judgment that was yours and mine upon his body. When Jesus came, he did not come to be glorified, but rather he came to serve, serve you, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. When Jesus came, he did not come here to make his best life now. You know what he came to do? He came to die. And so here we see the heart of the son and his father, the obedient son in whom we are all invited to share in. And, and, and my, my, my uh, challenge for you this morning as, as, uh, as we, I'm just going to ask the worship team to come up and, and we sing, is that what you need to know this morning is that you need to know God as your father. You need to know God as your, not just God, not just creator, not just redeemer, but as the God who has always existed as father. The son receives all the riches from his father, and here's what he does for you. He says this, Omar, enter into this. Come into this relationship. He provides a way for sinners to find God as their father. He offers us entrance into this. And here's where I want to I tell you a, a kind of a, a word for you. And I don't know who this is for this morning, but there are many people, many of us today, that when I say, who wants to give the life for Jesus? I do. Who loves Jesus? I do. Who wants to wear their, carry their cross? I do. And then I say, do you love your father? Do you love your father in heaven? And we go, uh, uh, well, yeah, but I love Jesus. True healing from sin will not come unless we embrace God as our father. The son of God saves you, but the father heals you. The son invites you in, but the father keeps you in. The Son sheds His blood for you, and the Father welcomes you in into His embrace. This morning, as we think about these passages, it's much more than a theological idea that what Jesus is doing. He's making God personal. And if you're here this morning, and, and you have um, maybe, maybe things in your heart that you don't see God as your Father, and this is for me personally, saints. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going through this stuff. I'm relearning what being a son is is if you don't feel that God is your father, that you have yet to taste the beauty and glory of the gospel. You can know here mentally, Jesus died for my sins, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. You can know all that. You can memorize scripture for all you want. But until you don't sit and bask in the love of the father and say, Father, I love you. Father, I love you. Father, I love you. You haven't truly tasted the gospel. Would you say that with me? When we pray, I'm going to pray for you and, and we'll sing. Father, I pray that this morning, as we think about the Son's benefits that Jesus receives of raising up the dead from death into life and, and Lord, bringing this, this crucial judgment between truth and a lie to all mankind, God, that, that for those who are believers, those who come to Christ, Lord, we will not be judged, but we will be rewarded for our relationship with you, a relationship based on love. Father, I pray that we may be people of our Father. I pray those this morning who struggle with feeling loved, those who struggle with the loss of someone this past year and feel alone. Father, those who, are, who think they know the gospel, but that can't even say, I love you to the Father, who can't even receive the Father's tender word of, you're my favorite. I see you. I see your struggle. I see your heart for me. Although it is weak, although it is so sometimes so weak and temporary, I love you. Father, that we may hear that word that we do not need a man to affirm us. We do not need a school or a job. Or a, or a fancy preacher or music to make us feel loved, but we need the Father's heart. I need the heart of my Father to tell me I am His Son. 
I am his daughter. Father, would you teach us to rest in this and to know that Jesus' entire argument of equality with God rested on his love in this beautiful dance of love with his Father. Would you stand with me as we worship? We close in one.